Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, weird history, and spooky history. Spooky season is almost at an end, my friend, and we are going to spend it together talking about a spooky season classic. Vampires. But not just any vampires. However, before we get into the episode, I would just like to remind you that there are spooky history stories available on Patreon right at this moment. So if you need some more spooky history in your life, you can head on over there and listen to the first three minutes for free or listen to the whole episode by joining any tier. As an independent podcast, the contribution of patrons keeps this show going. And as a big thank you for reaching 60,000 history BFFs over on Instagram. I will be having a 10% off sale till the end of October for all merch. And that includes the spook seasonal designs as well. And if you haven't already, why don't I head on over to YouTube. Subscribe. It's free. Subscribing is always free. And it's really, really helpful. But enough of that. Housekeeping time is over. Spooky time has begun. In our very last spooky episode this year, we are talking about a Halloween classic, vampires. But they are not the vampires that you know, nay, nay, dear one, nay, nay. We are not only talking about Bram Stoker's vampires, we are talking about the OG vampires from India, the Vitala. And I would tell you to grab your garlic and a wooden steak, but uh, those things don't work on Vitala. But... If you have like a silver knife around, why don't you grab that and uh, get all cozy with your favorite little spooky time drink and let's get to it. When it comes to Halloween royalty, you have the mummy, Frankenstein, the wolf man, and Dracula. And as I like to call them, the four horsemen of the spook apocalypse. So dumb. <laughs> Anyways, Bram Stoker is considered the daddy of vampires, and sure, he, he totally is, for the Western world. Dracula is an incredible story and a staple in the classic spooky literature history world. And for as long as I can remember, I've always been told that Bram Stoker was inspired to write Dracula after learning about Vlad the Impaler, also known as Vlad III, Prince of Wallachia, now known as modern day Romania. And if you don't know who Vlad is, here's a little crash course. He was a bad dude. The end. JK. <laughs> Vlad Tepes was his name, and Dracula was his nickname, which means the son of the devil. And gracious, did he ever live up to that name. First of all, he was called Vlad the Impaler because he literally would shish kebab people from booty to mouth. Mm, I know, I know. And then he would put those shish kebabbed people essentially in his front yard, in front of his castle and around the town as a warning. And P.S., if you're watching the YouTube version, this is a picture of me inside Dracula's castle in Romania. Like, it, it, I went there. It was so cool. And if you stay for the end, for our final thought, I'll tell you a story of my Halloween in Transylvania. But I digress. Good old Vladdy made a point to create a terrifying reputation to intimidate and dissuade his enemies from messing with him. And enemies he had, dear one, enemies out the wazoo. He was most often in conflicts with the Turks and the Ottomans and sometimes his own people. In order to intimidate and deter anyone from hanging around and finding out, he did all manner of atrocious things. For example, he would boil people and make their families eat them. He would poison entire towns. He would set all sorts of fires and the whole impaling people thing and so much more and because he was a monster in real life he made the perfect inspiration for a fictional monster for years and even now people have said that after learning about vlad the impaler 
Bram Stoker began writing his classic novel, Dracula, bringing to life one of the most iconic spooky season monsters to ever dance, the Monster Mash. Vlad III was a terrifying yet obscure ruler until the novel came out, and now to many, the town of Transylvania is more fiction than reality, although it is very much a real place, and the historical figure is one and the same with the monster. But what if I told you good old Vladdy was not the first nor the only inspiration for the monster, and Dracula wasn't the first bloodsucker of its kind. What if I were to tell you that another devilish creature of the night had been flying through the pages of mythology for 800 years before Bram Stoker even thought about writing Dracula? Friend of the podcast, Gaurav Mohanty, author of The Sons of Darkness, came on for a lovely author interview and blew my mind with his many Indian history tidbits. And I am kicking past TK for not pressing the record button again to capture our chat after our chat about his book. But I digress. Things happen. We don't hold on to regrets here, okay? When we were talking after the show, he noticed some of my mythology books on my shelf, these these two specifically, and he began to tell me very casually, oh yeah, in Indian mythology, we've had vampires since the 11th century. <gasps> Excuse me, sir, what? And that immediately uh, set me on a hyperlink rabbit hole, which led me to an exciting place. Not only are the Vitala some of the oldest vampires, they are also an often forgotten inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. And if it were not for a lazy translation of a hella old story, we may not have ever had Dracula the Vampire. But before we talk about Bram Stoker and how he became inspired by the Vitala, let's talk about what the Vitala are themselves. Our little blood-sucking friends first appear in the Vitala Panchi... Oh my gosh, okay, whew, we can do this. Panchivimshati. Panchivimshati. P-A-N-C-H-V-I-M-S-H-A-T-I. Okay? A story written in the 11th century featuring a king in search of power, a tantric sorceress, and of course, the Vitala. In this story, the Vitala is described thusly. Its eyes, which were wide open, were of greenish brown and never twinkled. Its hair was also brown, and brown was its face several shades, which, notwithstanding, approached one another in an unpleasant way, as in an overdried coconut. Its body was thin and ribbed like a skeleton or a bamboo framework, and as it held on to a bow, like a flying fox by the tiptoes, its drawn muscles stood out as if it were ropes of coin. Blood, it appeared to have none, or there would have been a decided determination of that curious juice to the head. And as the Raj handled its skin, it felt icy, cold, and clammy as might a snake. The only sign of life was the whisking of a ragged little tail, much resembling a goat's. So, basically, this thing is pretty creepy looking and kind of gross. Bottom line. So now, if you do a quick Google search on what a Vitalia is, they appear to be extremely one-dimensional. They are bloodthirsty creatures that inhabit people's bodies and cause chaos and destruction wherever they go. They are bad to the bone and lack any sort of humanity, which is completely true, but that's just a fraction of the story. According to Indian mythology, the Vitala are the servants of Virabhadra, which is like the Mr. Hyde to the god Shiva's Dr. Jekyll. And they are also the attendants to goddesses like Kali, Hunuman, and Ganesha. There are different versions of how the first Vitala came to be, but the thing they all have in common is that the Vitala are created out of vengeance and or when a body is not given proper burial rites. When a body is not treated as it should be, the Vitala possesses it and uses it as a vessel in the day, and at night it leaves the body in search of blood and chaos. And just a side note, when they're out in the sunshine, they do not sparkle. 
like Edward Cullen does <laughs> during the daytime. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to, I had to throw in one Twilight reference and I cannot promise that I won't make another one, but I got my one in. So <laughs> now the way to get rid of Italia is basically the opposite of how they were created. They weren't given proper burials. So if you give a Vitalia a proper burial or sing mantras over it, then you can send the spirit into the afterlife and kick out the Vitalia. Or you could also just stabby McStab stab it with a silver knife. So it seems like silver kills a lot of spooky ghosties, like a werewolf, vampires. I guess that's it. <laughs> Just the two. But still, that sure is a coincidence. I want to know why. What about silver makes it good for killing monsters? Anyways, <laughs> like I said before, the Vitalia are not simply mindless, pestiferous creatures. Vitalia are actually extremely powerful and very sought after by ambitious rulers and practitioners of dark magic. And this is because the Vitalia can see into the past the present, and the future. They are able to uncover people's true intentions in an instant. In addition, their powers and connections to the gods can be harnessed and used in black magic. And in the very first story about Vitala, the ambitious king seeks the help of a tantric sorceress, who tells the king that if he brings her the Vitala that lives in the woods close by, she will use it to make the king the most powerful in the world. According to the story, the King Vikram ventures to the forest every single night and quietly tries to sneak up on the Vitala in order to capture it. But every night, for 24 nights, the Vitalia hears the king approach and makes him forget why he was there by telling him a story and ending it with a riddle. The king eventually becomes so confused by the end that the Vitalia is able to escape. But on the 25th night, the king finally manages to keep his wits about him and capture the hellish creature. On their way back to the palace, the monster, being able to see into the future, tells the king that the sorceress is going to use it to kill him and not make him great and powerful at all. Who knows if this was actually true, but the king believed the creature and they made a plan to kill the sorceress. Once they reached the palace, the Vitalia and the king dispatched the sorceress and the Vitalia swore to protect the king and his entire kingdom for as long as it stood. This is quite common in many Vitalia stories. Some people seek them out not to capture them and use them for evil deeds, but to seek protection. For many, Vitalia are like minor gods. And I use the present tense here because there are still many people who worship Vitalia as a god particularly in the Maharashtra area, the middle western part of India. They have a very active community of Vitalia worshippers, and there are two very famous Vitalia temples that people still worship at today. Just like people, the Vitalia have many personalities. Some are indeed evil, some are benevolent, and some just want to help and some are awful tree dwelling bloodsuckers who eat babies so Vitalia they're just like us <laughs> so how did these multi-dimensional creatures get turned into mindless vengeful beasties that terrorize virginal women count to 10 on Sesame Street and become a sparkly heartthrob of millions of tweens in the early 2000s errors. It is alarming, yet not surprising that many of the most influential historical events happen because of mistakes, laziness, and lack of sleep. Our story today was brought about by the former. A big old mistake plus a little bit of laziness thrown in there for extra spice. The Vitala Panchavimshati, the story of the King Vikram and the Vitalia, was translated, and I use translated very loosely here, and you will see why soon, by Sir Richard Francis Burton. He was an explorer, linguist, and soldier. 
He apparently spoke 29 languages and was responsible for translating many South Asian texts, including the Kama Sutra, 1001 Nights, commonly known as the Arabian Night. Well, nope, the Arabian? What is that? The Arabian Nights in English, and the Vitala Panchavish, Panchavim Shati. That M there tricks me up every time. Now, I use the word to translate loosely because, yes, he did translate it, but many an artistic liberty was taken and much of the cultural juicy bits were left out. In addition, he only translated 11 out of the 25 stories of the Vitalia Panchavimshati, there we go, I got it, which left out much of what made the Vitalia more dimensional. That's like less than 50%. I'm no mathematician, but 11 is less than than 50% of 25. <laughs> this lack of context stripped out the Vitalia's compassion, its wit, and many of its other powers besides murder and corpse possession. But I must point out that Richard himself was under no illusion that this translation was perfect. He is quoted to have said, It is not pretended that the words of these Hindu tales are preserved to the letter. The merit of the old stories lies in their suggestiveness and their general applicability. I have ventured to remedy the consciousness of their language and to clothe the skeleton with flesh and blood. So basically he was saying, I know it's not a full thing, but my version, my version is better. Which, Richard, come, come close. Come so close right now, Richard, okay? You are this close to getting a garbage human badge, my friend, okay? I need you to reel it in. Thanks very much. The original version was excellent. But I digress. The selection of the word vampire to translate Vitalia was also a choice and not completely accurate. When translated, Vitalia is more closely related to a spirit or a demon. Back then, as well, Vitalia were and are considered spirits, if anything, minor deities rather than vampires. But that choice to liken the Vitalia to a Western vampire would cause a domino effect that we are still seeing today. So how did Bram Stoker come into the picture? Well, little Bram Bram here was a weirdo. And I say that with all of the love in my heart, okay? We love a weirdo here. This is a safe place for weirdos. So little Bram Bram, we, we like him here, okay? But he was a weirdo. So... When Lil Bram Bram was young, he was a young man, his family was stationed in India for colonization purposes. Okay. And Bram became obsessed with the occult and Indian mythology, or at least the dark and biased portrayal of it that good old almost garbage human Richard created. Lil Bram Bram devoured all of Richard's books, everything he translated, including the Vikram and Vitalia stories. And through a very convoluted set of events that I could not find a clear answer for, Bram met Richard. They met each other through his close friend, through Bram's close friend, Henry Irving. And a quick side note, because this is not a Discovery Channel documentary and representation is important, Bram Stoker was gay. He was unfortunately a closeted gay man because of the times, right? And he maybe had some not-so-secret relationships with Walt Whitman and Oscar Wilde and probably, definitely, also Henry Irving. Because, I mean, the man wrote a book called Personal Reminiscences of Henry Irving after Henry had died. And you may be asking, why, why do I bring this up? Well, because LGBTQIA plus history is so important, my delicious little donut. And it's important to know that people who wrote classic literature like Dracula were a part of the LGBTQ community. And I also tell you this, for a little bit of malicious purposes. The next time you need to annoy a family member at Thanksgiving or Christmas or literally any other event, you can whip out this little fact out of your back pocket and tell them about it. I promise you, their little head will explode. You're welcome. I will digress. <laughs> 
This meeting of Bram and Richard was another one of those history-changing moments. After meeting Richard, Le Bram Bram would spend seven years writing Dracula for a plethora of reasons. He was studying Vikram and the Vitalia stories as well as countless other tales of the occult from India and did a massive amount of research which included Bad Dude Vlad. And Richard's influence did not stop there. In the book that I mentioned above, Bram writes about this encounter with Richard and describes Richard in almost the same way he would later go on to describe Dracula. So it seems that Richard had a lot of influence on the creation of the Dracula story. After years and years of research and rewrites and struggling to finish Dracula, Bram Stoker finally published it, forever solidifying vampires and Vlad into pop culture. But what about our friend the Vitala? It's impossible to say really why some things become popular and others don't. It could have something to do with prejudice against Indian culture. It could have had something to do with the audience that read Dracula for the first time. It could literally be any number of things that caused Vlad the Impaler to rise as the one and only inspiration and the Vitalia to fall and be swept aside. But fear not, dear one. The Vitalia, although forgotten as an inspiration for Dracula, has not been forgotten altogether. Countless books, movies, and musicals with much more depth have been made featuring the Vitala. And my personal favorite is that the Vitala Panchavimshati, yes I did it, has now been translated in full and much more accurately by people from India. So during the last few days of this spooky season, I would love if you spared a thought or two for our bloodthirsty friend. And the next time someone brings up Twilight, Dracula, or vampires, tell them about our friend, the Vitala. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thought. And as promised, I owe you a quick story time. So, when I was in high school, my brilliant and wonderful father thought it would be an excellent idea to spend time in Romania. My dad loves history, my family loves traveling, and we had the absolute privilege of living in Germany because my dad was in the military. So it was really easy to travel all over Europe. And he was like, we're going to Romania, we're going there for Halloween, this is what we're doing, forced family fun time. And we were all like, yes. Absolutely, yes. And as one does when you travel to Romania, we had to go to Dracula's castle. And we went there during the daytime. We had an absolutely wonderful and a little bit terrifying tour guide who told us all about the horrible, horrible things that Vlad the Impaler did. Uh, and it freaked my little high school self out, but I also loved it. After spending the day walking around Dracula's castle, learning about all of the things that he did, we then ended our day at a restaurant called Casa Vlad Dracula, which is located in the house where Dracula was born in Bram Stoker's book. And it was wonderfully kitschy. The waiters and waitresses were dressed like vampires. All of the dishes were slightly vampire themed. And it was just an absolutely fantastic time. And after our wonderful meal at Casa Vlad Dracula, my dad decided that it was time to go vampire hunting. Because, you know, when in Rome, when in Romania, <laughs> Go vampire hunting! And he decided that it would be a good idea to go to the cemetery that was very close by. Now I want to make it very clear that we did not break into the cemetery. It was open to the public, alright? It was just late at night and very creepy in there. <laughs> So myself, my dad, my little brother, and my mom, and a few other of the people who were in our tour group with us all went to this cemetery. And now all day long, we had been hearing about all of the terrible things that Vlad the Impaler had done and the curse that he had placed upon his own body, saying that he would rise from the dead again one day. And it was also Halloween night. So all of that combined together, I was freaked out, thoroughly freaked out. 
To me, every sound was a monster, every flash of light was a ghost, and, and every silence was just a moment before Dracula himself came out and sucked the life out of us. And my dad, being a dad, being the very daddest of dads, decided to do his due diligence as a father and scare the living bejesus out of me and the other kids on the trip. But then we all got the living bejesus scared out of us when the lovely old cemetery keeper told us that it, the cemetery was closing by popping out from behind a grave and yelling in Romanian and then yelling in English that the cemetery was closing so we need to get out. My little teenage soul fully exited my body because not only was I afraid that this man was Vlad himself, but then I was also afraid of getting in trouble. <laughs> so all of us ran out of the cemetery, thanked the old man who then waved us goodbye and thus concluded the greatest Halloween night of my life. Well, dear one, thank you so much for joining me in this last spooky season episode. I have had such a lovely time bringing you these tales from the crypt, and I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. And even though the spooky season is over for us here, it continues on on Instagram and Patreon. So head on over to those two places and get your fill of spooky season goodness. Don't forget, there is merch discount going on right now until the end of October to say thank you for 60,000 followers on Instagram. If you haven't already, consider leaving a rating or review, which really helps the podcast reach more potential history BFFs, which makes it more possible for me to keep on doing this podcast for you. Your support means the absolute world to me, and I can't thank you enough. And with that, I will bid you adieu. Please, please, please stay safe. If you are celebrating Halloween, it can get pretty crazy out there. And I would absolutely, I don't want anything to happen to anybody, but not especially you. So please make sure to stay hydrated, eat, not just candy, okay? Get a sandwich in you or something before you go out, all right? Do something that makes you happy this week. Drink your water and I will see you next week for our first interview of season seven. Okay, love you. Bye. Why is there a metronome right now? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>